Dude, the jacket is back. And you know what else is back? Biology. We're going back to the good old days of biology time. Hello everybody, I'm Karar, and finally I'm delivering on my promise to do a video on respiration. So fun. Don't we all love respiration? If you don't love respiration, how are you even living? What the heck? You literally respire every single second of your life. How can you not love it? But anyway, one of you guys wanted me to do a photosynthesis in the same video, but like, I was preparing for this video and there's so much information to cover that I'm probably going to split it into two videos. I am going to split it into two videos, not probably. And basically all I'm going to be talking about is the steps of respiration, how I remember it, and like, the logic behind it. Alrighty, first thing you got to know about respiration is that the net equation is you take your glucose, C6H12O6, and you want to turn it into energy. So, you know that humans have to breathe, so we got to get some O2 in there. And then you probably know that we breathe out CO2, and for some reason we poop out water too. And then if you balance the chemical equation like a cool kid, you get six on all these guys. Now this right here is the aerobic respiration equation with oxygen in it. It makes it a lot easier to remember the steps if you look at how many carbons we start off with, how many carbons we end up. We start with one molecule, glucose, with six carbons, and we end with six carbon dioxide molecules. We'll see how the, those are made. So clearly we had to break down this glucose so that we get a ton of energy, like a cool kid. So basically you could break respiration up into like three steps. You first got glycolysis, which like as the name suggests, you're breaking down your glucose. Then second, you got your citric acid cycle. And that's basically taking those chunks of glucose you have left over and extracting every little last bit of energy you can from it. And then finally, three, is the electron transfer chain. And basically the point of the electron transfer chain is that glycolysis and citric acid cycle don't always give you the energy in the type you want. It's like you have two companies except they give you some of the money in US dollars and some of the money in Australian dollars. Okay, no offense to Australians, but Australian dollars are pretty useless in the United States. So basically what the electron transfer chain does is convert the less useful things, the Australian dollars, or in this case, the NADHs and FADH2s, into the useful stuff, which is ATP. Okay, so let's get into the details, boys. What is more fun than the details? That is right, nothing. So basically in glycolysis, you start off with your beautiful six carbon glucose. And basically there are two stages to glycolysis. There's the energy investment phase, and then there's the energy payoff phase. And unlike real investment, these investments generally pay off, I'm not gonna lie. And basically what happens is that your cells invest 2 ATP, so they add 2 ATP here. And then during the second step, they get 4 ATP and 2 NADH. A pretty sweet deal, I'm not gonna lie. Of course, you could try to memorize the steps of glycolysis. I personally did it because I had no life in ninth grade. But you really don't need to, okay? You don't need to be like the nerdy ninth grade me, okay? Just please don't be like the nerdy ninth grade me, that's just depressing. But there are some important stuff that you should be aware of. Like how the heck does this become 2 ATP become 4 ATP? Well basically you know that ATP has a phosphate. And basically what the ATPs are used for in the energy investment phase is they add phosphates onto this glucose. So basically you just tag on two phosphate groups. And what happens is you're breaking up the glucose, right? So it breaks it exactly down the middle and you basically get C3H6O3 plus P and you get two of these. Now this right here is glyceraldehyde, this right here is a phosphate, so basically what happens is this is called G3P, or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now the cool thing about G3P is that it has a ton of potential energy, and it also has one too many electrons, and you know what happens when something has too many electrons, it gives it off, and it releases a ton of energy when it does so. So basically, it'll give its electron, and guess what it's gonna give it to? It gives it to the electron carrier NAD+. So basically NAD plus is an electron carrier and it snatches one of the electrons to become NADH. And remember, this guy wanted to lose an electron so he releases a ton of energy but then he reabsorbs it immediately and he gets a new phosphate group because you know, phosphate groups are like the same thing as energy. The more phosphate groups you have, the more energy you have. So this becomes C3H6O3 plus two phosphate groups and this happens twice because we have two three 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 what the heck G3P molecules. So now, guess how many phosphate groups we have? We have four phosphate groups. And if you have four phosphate groups, how many ATPs are you gonna make? That's right, you make four. So that makes so much more sense, right? Like, we started with two of these molecules with only one phosphate each, and each one gets a new phosphate. So you're adding two more uh, ATPs, and now you get four ATPs out of it. And also, because you're releasing an electron, you also get two NADHs. So essentially, you put in two ATP, you get out four, so you have a net gain of two ATP. So basically, at the end of the energy payoff phase, you're left with your favorite molecule, pyruvate. And basically, the main things you gotta remember about glycolysis is that you start with glucose, 
you end with pyruvate and you get two ATP and two NADH. Okay, now we're done with glycolysis and now we gotta go to the citric acid cycle. However, we have pyruvate now. In fact, we have two pyruvates because we split our glucose in half and each of those halves became a pyruvate. Unfortunately, this pyruvate doesn't get fed into the citric acid cycle, okay? Citric acid cycle starts with something called acetyl-CoA instead of pyruvate. Well, basically pyruvate looks something like this. And we want to get to acetyl-CoA, which looks like you have a CoA, obviously you got this CoA hanging out there. It's not that important, who cares about CoA? But basically, it has an acetyl group attached to it, which it looks like this. Like the way I like to remember what the heck acetyl means is like, I just remember that it looks like this is acetone, right? You got a CH3 there. And acetyl, you just chop one of these guys off. So the one thing you gotta remember about acetyl-CoA is that it has only two carbons. Co is not a carbon, okay? It's just a coenzyme. It only has two carbons. So basically, to get from here to here, we gotta delete one of the carbons. And the way we delete carbons throughout the whole respiration, the way we delete them is we just chuck out a, a carbon dioxide. Also, this is not like a super valid way to remember it, but you start with a negative, right? And basically, you get to a neutral thing. So we gotta get rid of one negative, so we chuck in an electron, and what happens when you chuck in an electron? We make an NADH. So essentially, when you go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, you get rid of one CO2 and one NADH, and that's cool. Alrighty, we made our acetyl-CoA, we are ready to get into the citric acid cycle. So just to recap, you take glycolysis, you take your glucose, you chop it in half, and now you got two pyruvates, and each of those pyruvates gets converted to acetyl-CoA, and now we're in the citric acid cycle. So basically the citric acid cycle is what it sounds like, it's a cycle. And basically you start with something, you end with the same something, but we're adding one thing into it, and we're pooping out a bunch of energy. Because the point of this whole respiration thing is to get us energy, so what would be the point if we don't poop out any energy? So basically what happens is you have a four carbon thing that's just hanging around, and basically, to start the citric acid cycle, you take your acetyl-CoA, which has two carbons, you yeet it in, these guys combine like cool kid, and they become six carbons. What the heck, why did it draw two arrows? Anyway, and then in this cycle, this six carbon thing gotta get back to the four carbon thing. And how do we get rid of carbons? That is right, we make carbon dioxide. So how, guess how many carbon dioxide we gotta make? That's right, we gotta make two carbon dioxide. And basically the way I like to remember it is that for every carbon dioxide in this cycle, you make another NADH. So you also get two NADHs. And then in the rest of the cycle, you make one of each thing. It's like an a la carte restaurant, you just order one of each thing you want. So, what's one energy thing? You get one, a one more NADH. Another thing you get is one more GTP, and you get one FADH too. And then if you wanted an ATP, you could convert this guy to more ATP. Oh my god, this is crazy. You get one of each. So, essentially, to get from six carbon to four carbon, you get two CO2, and then for each CO2, you get an NADH, and then you get one of each thing. So, net, basically what we get is two CO2, three NADH, two FADH2, I mean, what, no, what the heck? one FADH2, and one GTP, which can be converted to ATP. But this is only per acetyl-CoA. And we have two acetyl-CoA from the single glucose. So we just multiply this whole thing by two, and that's how much we get per glucose. All right, so now we have a bunch of junk floating around, right? We have our carbon dioxide. We got four from here and two from converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So that's six CO2. And that's all we wanted, right? So we're chill. We wanted to end up with six carbon dioxide. We got that. So these guys are taken care of. Then we also have two ATPs from here, and we also got two ATPs from glycolysis, so that's four ATP. But then we have heck ton of NADHs and FADH2. What the heck, we got six NADHs from here, we got two from glycolysis, that's eight. Then we got like two from converting acetyl to whatever, so now we got 10 NADHs that's hanging around. And then for FADH2, we got two of these boys. So these guys are taken care of, right? We wanted to end up with eight. ATP, and we wanted to end up with CO2, but what the heck are these noobs doing? Well, that's where the electron transport chain comes in. I do not know whether I said that right, I'm pretty sure I slurred every single word of there. Electron transport chain, there we go. The ETC. And basically, these guys, we gave them electrons, right? So now they gotta give other electrons back. So basically, the ETC is a bunch of proteins in your inner mitochondrial matrix. So you just got a bunch of proteins looking like this epic. And basically, this kind of looks like a hill, right? So what happens is, each of these carriers drops off an electron, a minus charge, and it rolls down the hill, and it uses that hill to generate energy. It's like a dam, right? Like, as you let water through, you use it to turn turbines, and then that generates energy. Same thing here. And the thing that pulls it down here is an oxygen molecule. Now, the reason why this works is because oxygen is really good at oxidizing stuff, in which case it likes to take electrons from other things. So, so basically, this oxygen pulls the electrons through, and then it uses this energy to pump H plus ions 
out here. Now, the thing that I get confused with a lot is like, does it pump things out of the mitochondria or into the mitochondria? Like, this is not the technical definition, but the way I like to remember it, shh, don't tell anyone, is that like, you don't want to pump a bunch of ions into yourself because then you're going to get really acidic and that's not good for yourself or mitochondria. Yeah. But anyways, basically what happens is it pumps it out of the inner part of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space. Because you know that a mitochondria has two membranes. So this right here is intermembrane space. And this right here is inside the mitochondria. Another thing to keep in mind is that this guy drops his electrons off here, but FADA2 is weaker, so it drops it off at the lower place over here. But anyways, the point is we are pushing a bunch of H plus ions out, and now that there's so many on the outside, they want to come back in. So that is where chemiosmosis comes in. So basically, we saw one way of making ATP, right? That was just directly taking a phosphate group and putting it on ADP. So that right there is substrate level phosphorylation. And you do ADP plus a phosphate yields ATP. And that's how we generated D4 ATP. Wow, yo. But 4 ATP is nothing, okay? So we got to use oxidative phosphorylation. Basically what this is, is you use the proton gradient you created, the one that want to come back in, and you use that to drive ATP generating turbines, which are called ATP synthase. So basically it's like you have your membrane, you have like a rotor kind of thing. Technically it doesn't look like this, but basically these H plus ions try to get through, it turns the rotor, and the rotor generates ATP. And that process, the process of these protons coming in and generating energy is called chemiosmosis. Because you're basically moving from one side to another, it's like osmosis and it generates energy. So chemiosmosis. Okay, so now we've converted all these guys to some ATP, and let's talk about how the conversion factors work. So basically what happens is each NADH puts some electrons in, and those electrons push some uh, protons out. To be specific, each NADH molecule pushes out 10 protons. Each FADH2 thing only pushes out 6 protons. And it takes 4 protons to make an ATP. So this corresponds to 2.5 ATP, and this corresponds to 1.5 ATP. Now I've heard a ton of conflicting sources about this, which is really annoying. Like in Science Bowl, they're like 3 and 2, but Campbell is like 2.5 and 1.5. I don't know who's correct, but whatever, this is what I like. I, I think Campbell is probably going to be right, and that's probably what's going to show up on Usabo or whatever. And AP Bio, so like, I mean, might as well go with this. Science bowl sucks, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm kidding. So if we have 10, then this corresponds to 25 ATP, then this corresponds to 3 ATP. So we have 4 plus 28 gives uh, the total of 32 ATP. Now, unfortunately, we don't always get 32 ATP. And there's basically like three reasons for that. So the first reason is because you have to move the NADH from place to place. So let us talk about where things happen, right? So you got your epic mitochondria right here and this is your cytosol. And basically glycolysis happens out here. And that makes sense, right? Like every single animal does glycolysis in some way to generate energy. That's literally the only way to get energy out of glucose. And not all bacteria have mitochondria. So clearly uh, the glycolysis has to happen in the cytosol. However, once we start doing oxygen related stuff, like the only reason you would want to do citric acid cycle is to generate NADH, right? And the only way you could use NADH is if you have an oxygen to drive the electron transfer chain. So it takes the results of glycolysis, yanks them into the mitochondria, and then after that, it runs the citric acid cycle, everything inside here, citric acid cycle. And the ETC happens in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this is glycolysis over here. However, glycolysis generates some NADH, and this NADH has to be transported across the membrane. So sometimes it gets converted to NADH, but sometimes it gets converted to FADH2. And FADH2 is a lot more lame, so sometimes we lose energy that way. Another reason we might lose energy from the 32 ATPs is because we might use the energy created by the protons to not just make ATP, right? Like if you uh, want to generate heat, what you basically do is you let the proton protons <laughs> protons go through the membrane without generating any energy, and then it gets converted to heat instead. And then the last reason is just because there's not an exact like uh, conversion factor between protons and ATP. It's just not an exact thing. So 32 is like a maximum, basically. Okay, the one last thing I wanted to talk about is how glycolysis is regulated, right? And basically there's one really heckin' cool enzyme called PFK, phosphofructokinase. And you've probably heard this name, and if you haven't, it's pretty important, remember it. And basically, it's when you take your C6H12O6, which is your glucose, and basically you know that in the energy investment phase, it adds two phosphates to it. And basically what PFK does is it takes, it only has one phosphate originally, it adds one at a time, Basically what PFK does is it adds the second phosphate. Now like this glucose with one phosphate is pretty common, right? Like cells often just store it like with one phosphate, but two phosphates is not common. You only do two phosphates if you want to do glycolysis. 
So basically what PFK does is it forces it into glycolysis. So essentially PFK is what determines the rate of glycolysis. So all the regulation of glycolysis is basically done through this enzyme. And basically if we want to logic it out, if you have too little ATP, right? That means you have too much ADP and the ADP is converted to AMP. So basically AMP causes the rate of glycolysis to increase by stimulating this enzyme. But if you have too much ATP, right? Then you want to slow it down so ATP inhibits the enzyme. Similarly, citrate, if you have too much citrate, right, this is the first step in the citric acid cycle. It converts to 4-carbon, it converts to 2-carbon, acetyl-CoA, makes it into 6-carbon, that's citrate. If you have too much citrate, that means your citric acid cycle is stuck, in which case you don't want to keep doing glycolysis, right, because then you're just going to be making a bunch of stuff, but the citric acid cycle is not using it. So citrate and ATP are negative, they inhibit this stuff. Okay, epic, I think we've covered every single thing that I wanted to talk about. Basically, that's how I think about glycolysis, uh, citric acid cycle, electron transfer chain. I like to think about it in terms of the number of phosphates, number of like carbons, number of oxygen. Just think about it in terms of the molecules that are present. Alrighty, I hope that helped. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what other bio videos you guys want. I'll be doing photosynthesis soon. Hopefully it can help you guys memorize that nonsense with photosystem 1 being after photosystem 2. It was so triggering. It literally, their, their name is the order they're discovered. It's so weird. But anyways, as always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Thank you guys for watching again, and see you guys next time.